Today, I want to talk about how did Abraham please God? And if we answer this question, I believe that we will answer the question for ourselves. How do we please God? So, Heavenly Father, Lord, we just thank you and we praise you, Lord. We ask that you speak to us. Speak through me. Speak to us, Lord. Speak to our hearts, Holy Spirit, and help us to glorify your holy name here on earth as you are glorified in heaven. We ask this all in the mighty name of Jesus. Thank God. Amen. So, first thing that we have to answer is what pleases God? And we got uh, a familiar scripture. And in fact, this is from the book where it is prophesied that Jesus would be born in Bethlehem. It's from the book of Micah. So Israel, uh, throughout its history, had been attempting to please God. And they'd had, um, let's just say they didn't have very much success with it. In fact, we would see all the ten tribes, the northern tribes, fall away from God, and then eventually the two southern tribes would also. There was never a righteous king mentioned in the, in the ten northern tribes, but the, the two southern tribes would sometimes have a king that pleased God. But in a whole, Israel was not pleasing God. God under the Mosaic Covenant. And so in Micah chapter 6, verses 6 through 8, and by the way, if you want the scriptures, you can always, uh, you can click on this uh, thing. We need to put more of these around, but uh, you can click on this uh, UR code, and it will give you the scriptures. Amen? Hallelujah. But in Micah 6, 8, 6, 6 through 8, the word of God says this, what can we bring to the Lord? Shall we bring him our burnt offerings? Shall we bow before God the most high with our offerings of yearling calves? Shall we offer him a thousand rams or 10,000 rivers of olive oil? Shall we sacrifice our firstborn children to pay off for our sins? No, that doesn't please God. No, O oh people of the Lord, the Lord has told you what is good, and this is what it requires of you, to do right, to love mercy, and to walk humbly before your God. God was never looking for a bunch of religious acts to be right before him. He didn't want a bunch of do's and don'ts. He didn't want you doing religious acts. He didn't, he didn't even, uh, uh, he didn't want sacrifices. He didn't want all these things. He was showing the people of Israel what, if you're going to try to live righteously on your own, if you're going to try to follow these 600 and some laws, you're going to have to do them perfectly and with the right heart and by the way, nobody was able to do them. Righteous acts, self-righteous acts, can I put that word in there? Self, it's a four-letter word and, and for the believers. Self-righteous acts never please God. The law was put there as a guidepost or a measuring stick saying that we could never measure up to being so righteous to be considered right with God. And so in Isaiah 64, 6, we see a, a, a famous part of scripture. We are all infected with sin and we are considered impure. In fact, it goes on to say, when we display our righteous deeds, they are nothing but filthy rags. Now, I'm not going to tell you what those filthy rags were, but let's just say they weren't clean, amen? You would want them on your dining room table while you were eating. How's that? Okay? Um, and so the Word of God says, like autumn leaves, 
We wither and fall, and our sins sweep us away like the wind. So sin left unchecked will completely destroy me and you. But we still don't know how to get those righteous acts. In fact, Romans 3, 10 says, as the scriptures have said, no one is righteous, not even one. We have a big problem. We have a big problem because no matter how good you are, no matter how many good things you do, they're not good enough for God. Does that seem like a hard word? It is a hard word. It's, 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 it's really a tough thing to hear that. But here's the good thing. The good thing is this, is that you're not depending on how good you are. You're going to depend on how good Jesus was. It's Jesus' righteousness, his sinless life here on earth, God becoming man, that by accepting his righteousness, we are considered right with God. Thank you, Jesus. Amen? But I, there is one requirement of you. Oh, was Pastor Brett coming against Ephesians 2, 8 through 10? That it's not of works? There's something required of each person to be to get this righteousness of Jesus Christ. And this, my friend, is how Abraham pleased God. It's by believing. It's by believing. In Romans 4, verses 2 and 3, lays this out. If a man, eight, and we're, again, we're talking about Abraham, and Romans chapter 4 is referencing Abraham. If Abraham's good deeds had made him acceptable, acceptable to God, he would have had something to boast about. But that's not God's way. God's way isn't that you are all proud and mighty and you act like you believe God and you act like you're righteous before God and you are ugly on the inside, amen? God ain't into that. I, I used to watch people walk around and I go, they would say, save, sanctify, fill with the Holy Spirit. And I would say, how long ago? Not, in, not to their face. I wasn't that mean. <laughs> no. For the scriptures tell us. And by the way, this is also Genesis 15, 6. That Abraham did what? He believed God and it was counted unto him for to his righteousness. Believing God is what makes you right before God. Believing that he is the creator, that he has come to rescue us, that he has sent his only begotten son, and that we are considered righteous because we believe God and we have faith in God. And let me just go on to state that faith and believing are pretty much the same word. They came from the same root. Hallelujah. So by believing God, you and me are considered right with God. In fact, our sins are propitiated over to 
Jesus Christ. And that, my friends, is why he died on the cross. He died, he bore your sins and my sins for all that would believe. Amen? And so we are given this scripture in Romans. If you will openly declare that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that you are made right with God, it is by openly declaring your faith that you are saved. So you have to believe that Jesus Christ is your Savior and Lord and that as you give your life over to Jesus, because believing is an action word. Believing is making you do something that you wouldn't be doing if you didn't believe. Does that make sense? We're not talking about devil believing faith here. The devils believe and they tremble. Amen? That's what... James tells us, but we are, we are called to believe at a higher level than the devils, amen? We are called to believe God in that it causes change in our life. So it is by this believing that your heart is made right with God. Notice how it says your heart, not your fingers, not your toes, not anything that's connected to your flesh, but your heart, the inner part of you is being changed as you believe God from glory to glory. And the, see, the thing, the thing that's different about the Christian religion is that a true believer is being changed from the inside on out. The outside doesn't change first. It only becomes a whitewashed fence. But God wants to change it, you from the inside out. And that means that you can walk the walk and talk the talk. Hallelujah. Look, you, if you try to change the outside, and many churchgoers, many people have tried to uh, go to church and and believe and, and follow Jesus, they haven't allowed the Holy Spirit to change their heart. That's why they fall away because they've only been changed on the outside. God wants to change us on the inside. And thus we see we, when we believe in Jesus Christ, we get his right, righteousness. This, my friends, is the essence of our faith that we believe on the making Jesus Christ Lord. And so we are told in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6, that it's impossible. It's impossible to believe God. Right. I was an alcoholic from the time I was 16 years old up until seven years ago. But the thing was, is that my parents put me through Christian schools. You know, I went through Christian schools, graduated Christian schools, and I read the Bible. I didn't believe in it, but I read it like one reads a science book, a math book, or whatever, because that was part of my curriculum, the Bible. So I used to study it very intently so I could find little discrepancies that I could harass the teachers with. Like I would say, hey, Brother Gibson, how many gods are there? And he'd say, well, Lance, that's monotheism, one God. And I'd say, well, is that right? Well, then how come I was reading Genesis 3, 16, it says, God let us, said, let us make man in our image. If there's only one God, who was he talking to? And he would get up, they would get upset. Well, of course, that's the Trinity. He should have known that. But my point is, is I studied the book really just to find discrepancies and all that. And I was an alcoholic, you know, all my adult life, in and out of jail for DUIs, all that kind of stuff, you know. But seven years ago, I got, you know, I, I just got tired of living like that. I got tired of hurting the people that love me, you know. And I, you know, anybody has got an addiction, they know, man. It's a terrible way to live. It's just an existence. But um, I checked into a motel with the idea of drinking myself to death is what I planned on doing. I really did. And um, it was Christmas Eve, man. I just got a DUI. That's, that's why I'm here now. I, I was driving through Michigan, and I got a DUI in Michigan. And now I got sober. I bought a home out here, got a great job. Things are great. But um, I checked in that motel with the idea of drinking myself to death. You know, I sold a house in Delaware. I had a daughter that lost her life, so I had the money from the house, and I was just going to drink and drug myself to death, you know. 
But um, it was Christmas Eve, and I called my oldest daughter, and she said, Dad, what about me, you know? And I never thought about that, you know what I mean? I never thought about that. So I got off the phone, and I knew the Bible. I know the Bible. I didn't believe in it, but I knew it. But I, I, got, I, I did. I got down on my knees, and I said, okay, God, I know your word. But I had an intellectual knowledge of it, nothing in the heart. But I said, you know what, God, listen, if, help me to live or let me die. Because that's, that's, that's where addiction takes you, man. It just, so I wanted, you know, teach me how to live or let me die. And I told God, I said, this is what I will do. I said, every morning when I get up, before I turn on TV or smoke a cigarette or drink a beer, I will read the Bible for at least 15 minutes. I'll only listen to Christian music, so I found a station called K-Love, and I said, I won't hang around anybody that's negative. You know what I'm saying? Like, if they're negative and talking crazy, I get away from it, right? And I said, help me, God. Now, I was a, I was a chronic alcoholic. I got a lot of DUIs and all that. It's a miracle I got my license back. Tried out running the cops every time, too. I was, I was just a mess, you know? But um, that night, you know, something changed, man. I didn't feel nothing or nothing like that. But three weeks had went by, and I noticed I hadn't drank nothing. You know? But, 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 but the thing is, though, is now I've got almost seven years sober. You know what I mean? And, and it's wonderful, you know? And, um, I, you know, and it's all God there, man, because I went to AA. I went to drug and alcohol programs. Best money could buy, nothing helped, you know? But I did that with God. I said, God, if you're, if you're real, if you're real, I know what your book says. Let's do business. And I, and I meant it, you know what I mean? And I got to say now that, thank you, but I give it all, God, all glory to God for that. But I got to say now, though, man, this past seven years has been the most wonderful years that I ever had. Now, I just want to end in this, though, because about... I don't know, six years ago, I was sober for a year, and I got really sick with something. I don't know what it was, but I was sick. And I, and I had the idea. I said, you know what? I'm going to go get a half pint of rum. Now, I've been sober for a year. I said, I'm going to go get a half pint of rum, just, just drink it down and knock myself out. You know what I mean? Because I was that sick, right? I loved rum. That was my drink. I made a drink 50-50 like I used to, 50% rum, 50% Coke, man, and I... I took a drink and I couldn't do it. It gagged me, right? So I said, oh, okay, I gotta make it weaker. I gotta make it weaker. <laughs> Listen, I made one, I mean, I could, I don't know, man. I tried to drink it. I really did, thank God I couldn't. But every time I would try to swallow it, it came back up. Now, you know, now listen, but, but when I was drinking, you couldn't get me to go to an AA meeting. I didn't like it, you know. I wasn't ready to quit, I guess, all right? But now, sometimes on Sunday nights, I go because I ain't got nothing else to do, you know? But I'm delivered, you know what I mean? Like, Amen. But, yeah. But, but listen, my thing is, is I go to them AA meetings, and I hear people saying, and God bless them, you know, but they'll say, oh, my God, I had such a hard day today. I had to go to three meetings and call my sponsor four times, and it was just so hard not to drink today and all that stuff, right? And, man, listen, like, I tried to drink after that. And I did, see, he did something to you, man. And, uh, but like he was just saying, you know, like for years I had the book intellectually, you know, academically. I knew it, I knew it, but I didn't have it in my heart, you know. And really what Lance was getting to was something, there's something more than just this. This, my gold rose Bible, the Bible has to be combined with the Holy Spirit. Without the combination of the two, this becomes a newspaper for those who remember newspapers, amen? Um, and, and, and so the word has to be combined with the Holy Spirit. And that's what believing God is all about is allowing the Lord to do a work in your heart because that is what's going to keep you doing the work on the outside I guarantee you go to like Lance was saying you go to every meeting you want to but unless there's a change in here you're going to have a problem 
Hallelujah. And so thus, it's impossible to, be, to please God without truly believing in him because you will never be changed from glory to glory. So believing really is the action word that we have to apply to our life. It believing, true believing in God causes inaction. It causes you to change. And like we are I'm talking with people last night. Look, you can't depend on everything around you changing. You've got to let God change you, right? Let God change you. And then guess what changes? Everything around you changes, right, Lance? It doesn't mean you won't have problems or issues or things go wrong. It just means that you've changed. And now you are capable of living a holy, set-apart, righteous life unto God. Does that mean you'll never sin again? No. It just means that your sins are forgiven. And as long as you don't become a practicer of sin, you are right. So what does godly believing look like? Well, for Abraham... It was him leaving his home territory and becoming a foreigner in a foreign land. So Abraham took a risk. And it was, in Hebrews 11, 8, we see it was by faith that Abraham obeyed God called, when God called him to leave his home and go to another land and would give him his inheritance an inheritance in this promised land. He went without knowing where he was going. So believing causes you to do things that you normally wouldn't do, amen? It causes you to take risks, to take chances, but godly chances that really are you obeying God. So real believing causes real obeying. Hallelujah. And we have an we have a example under the new covenant. We have the woman with the issue of blood who was cured of that after suffering with this for 12 years. It is, this is in Mark chapter 5, verses 25 through 34. And she, in verse 28 of Mark 5, 28, she said, she just thought, if I could just touch the hem of Jesus' garment, I would be healed. How crazy is that? He's, you know, in the, in the Jesus' disciples said, I, everybody's touching you. But she had a unique touch. When she touched the robe of Jesus, it was that belief, that faith, that release, the power of God, the grace of God in her life, and she was healed. And you've got to understand about this woman with the issue of blood. She was breaking thousands of years of tradition. She wasn't supposed to touch a man. She wasn't supposed to be around People, because she had this disease of having an issue with blood. She wasn't supposed to touch a rabbi who was Jesus was considered. But she broke through all those religious traditions with praying death. And she goes, if I could just touch his hem, the hem of his garment, I would be healed. But it wasn't the touching that did it. It was the believing and then acting out that believing by touching the garment. So real believing calls us to take real risk. And I want to close with this. It's not just a one-time believe God and you're all set. 
I believe that you grow in grace as we believe God. As we remember Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 through 10. For you are saved by grace. It's a work of God so that no one can boast. And as the author of this wrote, Ephesians chapter 2, he was referring to the religious acts of the Jews. Those religious acts were never going to save anybody. They had no chance of saving anybody. They were meant to point to something greater. And check this out. Before there was the law, the Mosaic law, the, the Ten Commandments, there was Abraham. Abraham pre-existed the law. But we are given the gospel message, the good news, that by believing, we would be considered right and would come under our father Abraham. And so, in Ephesians chapter 2, it's about breaking those religious traditions that have held us captive for so many years. And it's about believing God. And as you believe God, you get grace. And the more you believe God, the more grace you get. The more grace you get, the more power you have. God's part is grace. The power of God to overcome sin and a sinful world. But our part is believing. We are called to believe God. Believe that he sent his one and only son. And through him, we have a propitiation for our sins. Somebody who stood in the way of our sins and took the penalty for our sins. Hallelujah. And I just wanted to say this about James who um, who was uh, a homeless guy? He had a he had an addiction problem, and um, and he was the one that we believe that passed away uh, a few days ago. And honestly, he probably passed away of an old D. He o overdosed. Okay, he probably did. But see, here's the thing. He was at this altar, and he accepted Jesus Christ as his Savior and Lord a month beforehand. And look, and he, he, wasn't, he didn't have much time to go through. He wasn't delivered. I got it. But there's a hope that he is in heaven today because he accepted Jesus Christ. He believed in Jesus Christ as his Savior and Lord. That is James' story, and I hope to see him in heaven. Wouldn't that be cool? And so that, my friends, is why we do stuff outside. That's why we go out there. That's why we're out in the community, because we want people to believe God. Amen? And to become sons and daughters of Abraham, the father of faith. So let's all stand.